Hello and welcome back to this masterclass. Um, thank you, Richard Hill, for coming on. And um, we've got a couple of people in here for um, discussion, including myself. But um, I'm going to hand it over to Richard. And then if it's okay with those people who are here, if you're okay with being recorded, um, we're going to um, hit um, Richard up with questions about his work. I'm just going to now hand it over to you first, Richard, just to start, and then we'll be asking you questions, I guess, when you're done. Okay. Thank you very much. Nice to see everybody. And uh, to all you people in later listening land, uh, you've missed the opportunity of, uh, of, of testing me. But the the essence of what I'm uh, just giving a, a, a brief reprise of yesterday, and I was just beginning to say to, to Rene, slightly to my surprise, uh, I found it useful, and hopefully it was interesting for everybody listening, to actually do a really forensic breakdown almost of, of this idea of curiosity. Um, because I'm concerned about the fact that we have lots of conversations about things that we don't really understand. And so it requires uh, a slightly more, more uh, in the context of workshops and of professional engagements, a slightly more detailed look. We, we were just recently uh, in the conversation talking about Dan Siegel. And of course, he has a book on mind, which is you know, 400 pages long. And you'd think, wow, don't you just define it in three or four paragraphs and that's it. But there's so much more to investigate. Now, in curiosity, um, I described this, that to my way of thinking and the way I'm thinking of it and based uh, with a deep base through neuroscience and um, and genetic sort of ideas, that we actually have three platforms of curiosity, which is certainly the one we're used to, the curiosity for information, which uh, brings about knowledge and brings about understanding through investigation and 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 uh, experience, uh, exploration. Then we have a curiosity for receiving information and through play. So we have a curiosity for play. We want to see what if I did this? What about that? And how about and maybe if? So that's really about the what if. Whereas the this what is to the what if. Uh, but really, what is the key? to all uh, development and expansion of self-development and self-expansion is when you have a self-relevance to the information, the what, the what is and the what if that you've discovered. Because if you don't have self-relevance, then there you go, what is it? It's simply interesting information. Like, um, you know, here's a, here's a, here's a, a widget. Trivic. Oh, they're eye drops. Oh, I've got sore eyes. Oh, that's interesting. I wonder how they work, what they're doing. And are they other ones? Uh, oh, I've had ones like those before. This is really so. Suddenly, the object, the discovery, the thing we've been curious that, that we've done is curious and it's creative and it's related. So, what we need is the third one is a curiosity for meaning. Uh, the curiosity, which then allows us to have a sense of purpose. Um, because there is no purpose until something relates to the self. So then that goes on is, so what about possibility? So we know a lot about curiosity and actually over the next decade or so, I'll argue that we don't. And that's our problem, that we limit ourselves and we constrain ourselves to social definitions of, of these words. Um, but it's the, the real thing we're looking for. Once we've got an idea of what it is, and all the serendipitous possibilities that we didn't know, but I've got us and now got a sense of, and that it has a meaning for us. We then go, oh, oh, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then we start being creative. And this is the aspect of possibility. And possibility is the field of uh, the field of elements that are not yet known. The field of elements that are known is actually the what we have experienced up to date. And it is experience that creates knowledge. Um, not necessarily wisdom, because wisdom comes when you take that knowledge and you make it mean something by relating it to self. So this is why sometimes we have experiences when we're teenagers, and then when we're about 40, we go, ah, oh, I 
think, oh, is that what that was all about? Um, hopefully it doesn't take that long. But um, so possibility is this wondrous space. Now, in uh, again, talk about Dan, what Dan talks about taking from systems theory is that there's sort of three planes of possibility. There's the, of, of our life experience. We have the possibility field and in complexity theory and in quantum theory, the possibility field is everything. And all it does is have fluctuation. Now, if those fluctuations just fluctuate enough, boom, something pops up into reality. Now this is, becomes what we call the, what in complexity it's called the probability field. Those things that are likely to happen and that have happened. So basically they become not only experience, but those experiences that repeat themselves and become more common. Now out of this probability field, the theory is what pops up is into the, to the actuality field of what we actually feel. So we tend to bubble around with our thoughts and then something pops up into reality, into our conscious awareness. And that's the actuality field. Now, if in the actuality field there's lots of trauma, disturbance, disruption, confusion, upset, all the many things of therapies, or just social rubbish and crap and horrible, also lovely things as well, but the, the crappy things. The idea is that you need to go back to the probability field and try and repair that and have a better actuality. But what we talk about uh, nowadays is actually what you want to do is you want to go past that and back to the possibility field where you actually start. So this is why we use meditation and why we use hypnosis and why we use um, uh, focus of attention and why we go, go back to square one, not just the one in the middle. Uh, and the trouble with that, I said, that's great, but what's wrong with that? And I looked at it and I thought, well, it's all fairly linear. And complexity theory is all about things being not linear. So it's kind of like you've got to go from the actuality field through the probability field to get to the possibility field. And the probability field grabs us and holds us and says, oh, no, I've got another option. I've got another one that I know that is based on my experience. Whereas we want to get down here so we create new experience. So I think that image is not helpful, is not the most helpful image. And what I imagine is that the possibility field is a sphere, sort of a, a, a universal sphere, or, uh, almost uh, an expansive field. And that you and actualities instantly into possibility simply by triggering your body to move in that direction. And what's the trigger? What's the mechanism? Curiosity. That's the argument that I put forward. Now, here's the struggle of what's going on in life. We put all that experience is behind us. And it's kind of two dimensional, even though it might have shape, but fundamentally it's two dimensional, it can't change. Time, it's, it, 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 it no longer has the ability to be changed or altered. So it's static and it's changed. We can have opinions about it and we can have current thoughts about the past. And the past can create and manifest in PTSD or manifest in negative thoughts or manifest in positive thoughts, but it all comes from back there. And what people say is, I want to move into the future, but I'm a bit worried about what's going to happen. So can someone, what, what's the prediction? What, what's, what can I rely on? What can I trust uh, to be in my future to make it safe for me to move forward? And so what I fear that we do is that we actually sort of squeeze out, we drag a bit of stuff from the line and we stick it in front of us. And I'm gonna call this the probability bridge. So I just want a bit of probable stuff before I get into that possible stuff because I just don't feel safe. And unfortunately, it's a, it's a self-dooming activity because you start walking on the bridge and you get a bit across it and then you go, oh, well, I just need a bit more uh, predictability and, and reliability and, and uh, probability. And so you push it further and you push it further. And it's almost like having a balloon in front of you where there's this wonderful sphere, but you just keep pushing it away. And that is what happens to people. Say, tell me what I know. This is what they're saying, sales. 
sell people what they already own, what they already have, and you're more likely to sell than to sell them something new uh, and innovative and unexpected because they don't trust it. So you've seen that curve of, of acceptability where you have, uh, there's, there's about two or three percent who'll just take anything. Give me something new, give me something new. I think I'm one of those. Then you have about 9% who um, are, um, are prepared to, uh, uh, who are keen and, and, but come in fairly early. Then you have the early adopters, that's about 30 odd percent. Then you have the late adopters, about another 30%. Then you've got down the other end, another four or five percent who won't take anything. I mean, they've still got phones that you, you have to twirl the dial. Uh, so it's natural to want a little bit of, of future predictability. So how can I move directly in and engage in the possibility of possibility, but still have predictability and some kind of sense of safety? And I think this is where the mistake is. We don't need to, the bridge of it. What we have is the presence of it. What we have is the existence and everything that exists within us from our past, that is ourself, exists within the possibility field. So rather than three planes, it's one place and it exists to be utilized uh, as required. And this is why Ericksonian thing, the utilization. You can utilize what is known in order to safely then either step into or springboard, as I say, into the what is not yet known. And that is the joy of learning and knowledge. Because people say to me, oh, you, you study the brain and you study genes and you study all that. Well, then you know stuff and then everything gets dull. My God, no. Then I start to go, oh, yeah, so the genes and then that does that. So what if we do that? And, and is that energy? And as that goes down, now energy, oh, my God, we're down in quantum. Now, quantum, but what's quantum? No, quantum isn't this. I have to take a, a, a sort of um, metaphoric valium about 50 times a day because there's so much excitement going on in my head uh, that I have to go, oh, no, I have to get the magazine out or, oh, gosh, I've got to write some more of that book or, oh, there's a bill to pay. Uh, I was sorry, I was a little bit of uh, imagining probability bridges and, and various other items. So that's, that's sort of the, the, the description and the theoretical framework. How is it practical? How is it practical? And the practicality of it is what I've determined in similar ways to a lot of um, uh, sort of idealists, you know, sort of rather than the theorists or the practicals, that we create a brainscape and a bioscape. So I actually don't think they're separate, but, but we cr create a bioscape, a, a, a state of being that enables us to not require predictability in order to move forward. And that takes a bit of practice and training and confidence and confidence in the self that is made up of all these things back here. And unfortunately, a lot of people this stuff back there has made them feel unable to be confident, unable to be sure and unable to move forward. And the key to unlocking this is curiosity. So the possibility solution is to ignite us with the, with the uh, uh, energetic biosphere of curiosity which turns on all kinds of things, including brain, um, uh, uh, brain chemicals and things which is turning on genes, which is doing all kinds of wonderful things to create the proteins, to create the necessary biology we need to be able to move forward. And this is uh, what I will be trying to explain over the next rest of my life. So awesome. how, about, awesome. how about that for a theory or two? Awesome, Richard, um, because What's fascinating is you've come to a similar conclusion to me, but just from a different angle about. Oh, yes. And this is right, because all I'm describing is life. And this is what annoys me, actually, about a lot of a lot of um, uh, people in, in, in therapies. We've got all these therapies, 400 therapies, because their mind's a really good one. you know. And it's just stupid because all we've people have done is observed life 
observed what people do naturally that helps them and then we've expanded it and developed it and improved it and that's terrific but then we put our name on it and call it as and i know i do that you know we've called it mirroring hands and all it's mine and ernie's and, but um emdr the the business with it she did that and Francine said that herself, uh, because I saw people when they were going through shifts in the thing that their eyes, they would close their eyes and their eyes would move. So I thought I would investigate where it was. Uh, and so when I'm talking to therapists, I say, you need to learn a lot of therapies because when the client shows you what it is that they're most uh, inclined to resonate with, you need to recognize it because that's their problem. The problem is they don't recognize their own therapeutic genius. You just observe it and say, oh, let's do this. Oh, let's do that. Uh, whereas, unfortunately, people come in, we find out what their problem is, and we tell them the way to cure it using X, Y, Z. Uh, and uh, as, That limits, limits possibility and probability. Even. Right. As Erickson said, the best therapy is the one that you never repeat because that is the one that is most attuned to not only your client, but to you and to the co-created experience. I, I love that. I love that you brought that in. And interesting, I've had lots of in-depth conversations with my husband, he's an engineer. So why I then got into looking at quantum and other things like that is because we then had conversations. So I'm coming from a, not the neuro side of things, but the science side of the, yeah, the, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, yeah. Neuroscience, neuroscience is just one of the aspects. Science just means the knowledge of. Uh, again, it's a word that's been compressed by um, by social to say it is the experiment where there are no variables and you observe in the thing and the blah blah blah. Which is, it's just the knowledge of. And and Matt and I uh, in the science of psychotherapy are writing a book. Uh, we were asked to write a book on, on what we call the practitioner's guide to the science of psychotherapy. And so our book is, is fundamentally 20 chapters, which are essential summaries uh, of the fundamental elements of the 20 books in our, work, uh, our bookshelf that we all need to read. And we never get round to because there's too many books to read. Um, but we need to know, we don't need to know everything about everything, but we need to know about the existence of everything in order to be more creative. So that's the that's the point there. So I, I could just every time you say something, I could go on for another 10 minutes. Don't do that, Richard. Calm down. Let okay, people so talk. I want to hand it over to Kath or Julie if you have any particular questions for Richard, because that's what this is. Ask the expert uh, masterclass kind of scenario. Yeah. Um, that would require Richard being here all day. Uh, the reason being, I have just had that same excitement that Richard gets with, uh, I call them fizz buzzes. So as you were talking, Richard, I was like, yes, that's when Dan Siegel talked about that. And I've heard that talked about and, and this and that and the other, and they're all connected together. Yeah. So and, and they need to, so they all need to link together. Mm. It's when mm -hmm. you get this way out the wacko idea that doesn't even resonate that someone's just invented because they, they, they're trying to make a better mousetrap, but actually they didn't. So that's really good. It needs to resonate. That's our bodies naturally know. Yeah. Sorry, Kath. So, so I've noticed um, actually when, when I saw Dan Siegel present on this plane of possibility and, and I was in a room of therapists and psychologists and, and uh, lots of educated people, and I could see a sea of confusion, never mind about a sea of possibility, <laughs> because of course he was bringing chaos theory and maths and engineering, and I was getting really, really excited sitting there going, oh my goodness, this is exactly what we do. And I think, and this is just my kind of interpretation of what you've just said, that I think what happens for our clients is they fear that plane of possibility and they want to stay in the probability because that's the known and the familiar so, and taking them back to that space where everything is possible is is that skill of a really adept therapist that says you know have you considered what about have you yeah. ordered the cure well, and that's where curiosity comes in isn't it that that is curiosity takes you there but but that model is is i think the 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 understanding of it that is causing a barrier is this mm. idea that we have to get through the probability, we have to go back through the probability down to the possibility. So 
I don't think that truly represents the the, the concept of com of complex of complexity theory, mm -hmm. um, and the uh, and this idea of it being three dimensional that rather being something a plane that I go to, it's actually all around. And and this is actually when you think about because what they did to, was to describe it on the physics level, that you just had this plane of possibility and energy passes across it to an, an and uh, fro, and that energy sends bits up and little quarks and, and various and muons and things pop up, and then enough of them pop up together and they become a particle and so on and so forth. Yeah. But of course, as you can imagine, when that's happening in space, going back, whatever, it wasn't happening, uh, it was happening in a, uh, a whole, it was happening everywhere in amongst and the energy that was moving through was moving everywhere at the same time. So our possibility field is not something we go down to and repossibilize. Our possibility field is something that we can just lean into. Uh, and that's why the what if and the what about and maybe question uh, is so much easier when you just, you just say, just lean into it that so lean out of what you know and lean into what you do as different from this arduous task of avoiding all the things that your system says you can't and you can and you should and you yeah. shouldn't and all those things I, I just on that um richard i'm i'm hearing you on so many levels because that's some of what you speak to i've been working with in the online space for quite some time. No, I, I just know. have, yeah. just have dif different words for it, dif that's different all. words. Well, that's why yeah. we were so attracted to each other because we were talking on the same thing and we need yeah. to have different words. Yes, yes. Because you can explore elements of the possibility field that aren't necessarily tuned into mine. I mean, I don't yeah. have, <clears throat> uh, and yeah. uh, for example, I can't ever explore the possibility of someone this tall uh, who's a femur? It just, you know, I'm tiny. <laughs> he he knows tiny. I am. <laughs> but I mean, even if I pretend, it's that wonderful thing of what's it like to be a bat? That philosophical question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As soon as you are a bat, you're then beginning to talk about it uh, as a human being, and so it's not. So, what's it like to be Rene? Well, I could give a uh, an objective sort of discussion about it, but as soon as I do that, I'm filtering it through Richard. Yeah. So it is always different, mm -hmm. but that's interesting for Renee. If she says, what's it like to be me? And I give her, she goes, oh yeah, I have to see yes. it from that perspective. Um, but of course, for me, it's just, uh, it's, it's just a giving because I'm not. Uh, and I like that you brought that in too, because just for the people listening, Kath and Julie and anyone listening back in, I think that's where <clears throat> you and I are very similar. I was brought up with a family of actors. The, 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 the possibility and even the playing a different part is all part and pervasive. Yeah, the, the acting is fundamental. And this is where I learned this. I didn't, I learned the theory of this, but I learned all this stuff in acting school. Yeah. In fact, it's, it's one of the lectures I did at Ericsson one time was uh, everything I know in <laughs> psychotherapy I learned in acting school. Yeah. And, uh, and people were quite surprised. They were going, and I was actually trying to get them to behave in an acting sort of fashion, and uh, none of them seem to be able to do it. It was quite fascinating. Uh, they're really very bad oh, yeah. at it. But I, I, one of the things I said to them, I said, "Well, remember that uh, uh, Jimmy um, uh, Jimmy Stewart movie where um, it's a Wonderful Life, you know? And he was, uh, you know, he was doing there was a disaster economically, and 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 he was going, and he thought, oh, it's all my fault, and I've done, and he got this real belief that it, that that it was if he just didn't live, and he was down at the bridge looking in the things, so I could jump in the way and then get my insurance, and then it's all right. But if if I just never lived, there wouldn't be all these problems. I mean, this this belief started to really get into it so much so that he was starting to think about jumping off the bridge, and down comes the angel, all very cute, and says, oh, well, okay, let's Let's make it like you've never lived. And they go back and they wander through the, the town and nobody knows him. And then he finds his wife and she's a spinster and he's got no, none of the children were born. And, oh, no, these were stupid beliefs. Of course it was important. And he changes his beliefs and then everybody comes and he gets money and then there's a tinkle on the thing and a happy ending because it's a Hollywood film. Classic CBT. Classic CBT. What's your belief? Explore your belief find its um, uh, conundrums and then uh, form a, a more successful belief. Classic CBT, 
on a film 15 years before Aaron Beck ever thought of it. All Aaron Beck did was see it. And actually, he didn't even see it because he saw it mostly through Albert Ellis, through his REBT, which he brought out in the 50s. So all this stuff is so fascinating. It is there in front of us to be seen in the way we see it and then to be expanded upon to create possibilities that take us beyond. Now, everyone says, oh, I can't keep going into possibilities. That doesn't work. I've got to have the probability bridge because of all this. Didn't do that when you were five or two or one when all you had was possibility. And that's the beauty of it. Kath, what are your mm. thoughts? I'm sitting here, at, oh my goodness. I, I am trying to contain myself at the moment. <laughs> because, wow, I'm just thinking. Um, Let yourself go. Oh, you see, all axes go left, right, up and down, diagonal. Yeah. You know, I can just see that movement, movement of thinking, phenomenology is, you know, and this is where you start getting into those words of umwelt and ontology epistemology and i think it's really really important for for us as therapists to be able to understand that i mean that that philosophical question um that is a fantastic article you know what's it like to be a bat and and, and i tried to say to people if you can consider and imagine then that tells me that you've got curiosity and that means i can work with you in a way that's going to produce an outcome that's more than likely going to be helpful for you now, whether that person can think like a bat or think like a slug or, you know, whatever it is that they choose to do, I'm I'm then kind of utilising their ability to do what they need to in order to, to move them through what they need to. Sure. And it becomes less about me and more about them. Yeah. But I'm thinking that at the same time, that is exactly where I get my learning from is, oh, my goodness, this client struggles with this. And I wonder why that is. And I wonder if I can understand that from their perspective and and yeah. yeah my favorite I'm, I'm, my favorite words wonder you know that's interesting mm. and i wonder mm. and the uh, the there was a beautiful thing i actually think it was uh, steve colbert who i heard heard say it but they were i think it was i don't know whether they were talking about it but i conf conflated it with that thing of that we always try to be the best how can you be the best of yourself how can you be and the trouble is this thing best of yourself has got this sort of connotation of that's better than others. So this externalized issue, the the this winner loser world, as I call it, um, where where you're only a, a good person if you win and you're terrible if you lose. Uh, example: Trump. Uh, the and uh, Steve Colbert said, my parents taught me that. What if you seek to be the most of yourself? And I thought, yeah. And then I said, and then you add the possibility thinking. And what if you appreciate and always understand that there's always more of you? Possibly. And this is what is exciting for a client. It's not about how to fix, how to become a better person, cure your, your, your trauma. It's how to move from the trauma or from the disturbance or from the upset into something that you've not been that you and to become something more of yourself uh, that entails and sometimes what we do is in, in solution focused therapy you take something from behind that worked and you sort of try and reproduce it but you reproduce it differently into a different way and they go oh yeah well it's not like when i was four doing that but now it's like i'm 44 but i do it this way oh my god here's an idea and that insight that breakthrough moment is the shift from uh probability familiarity established uh tools into possibility and creativity uh, the difficulty is See, like CBT, classic CBT is creating an alternative pathway in the brain that is better than the one you're, 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 you're working in. Again, it's fundamentally just sort of working with what you think is a good idea and you only have ideas that are based on what you already know. Whereas we get the solution focus and some other therapies and play therapy and art therapy and um, sand tray therapy, whereas... What about something you never thought of? 
and I, I, I give you an example. I do this with people and I, I'll, um, uh, I usually use a bag, but we'll go through it. But I, I put something in a bag, like, um, uh, you know, well, like the, we'll go back to the eye drop I was talking about before. And I'll put that in a bag and hand it around and say, everyone tell me what it is. And they all have a guess. And few people will say, a, you know, a bottle of something. Other people will say different things. Uh, and then um, we open the bag, I pull it out and they go, ah, curiosity for information. It's eye drops. And those people who've said eye drops, fascinatingly, because of our win or loser world culture, the people who've said eye drops feel better than the people who haven't. People who've said something else go, oh, which is so fascinating. Rather than, wow, this, this thing of having delight about somebody else's delight is not encouraged in our culture. We, we tend to get our delight and then um, everybody else we don't care about. So then I'll say to people, I'll put it back to them and I'll say, so what else is this? Now, I know it's a, it's a thing of eyebrows, but what else is it? And uh, then it starts getting interesting. And, and I don't know, I just think someone will go, oh, it's an earring, um, but only one. So I'm a man. Because uh, we know why men only have one earrings because they had one earring and it hurt, so they weren't going to have another one. The uh, you know what else? It's a it's a very short tie. Um, it, it's a oh dear, it's something very young. and you start to play, and so people play and they start to invent they invent it. You know, a very uh, uh, it's a Melbourne Cup fascinator. Uh, I don't know, that's a new one. And then in the third part of the exercise. I'll say, okay, so who said that? Who, who said it was the, the Melbourne Cup fascinator? Okay, what's an issue you've got at the moment? What's something going on? And they'll say whatever. And I'll say, okay, Melbourne Cup fascinator. Melbourne Cup fascinator, your issue. Melbourne Cup fascinator. Something you haven't been able to solve. What's a new idea? Now, of course, uh, again, who's the genius? Not me. This is lateral thinking by De Bono. I know. Uh, and they'll go, oh, yeah, well, it's a small thing. I've got it on my head. It's only on the side of my head. I'm only using one side of my head. I'm just making stuff. I'm just ad living here. But that's not a bad idea. Actually, I'm only using one side of my head. Which side is it? Is it that side? Is it the right side? Oh, my God. I'm, I, oh, I'm stuck in the left side of my head. Ah, wouldn't have thought of that. And these type of serendipitous emergences and mirroring hands, people won't know that, but that's a, a, another workshop. But these type of improvisational activities that occur in a lot of workshops that have surprising things come out, they become breakthroughs. It's then the creativity that occurs after that. And we, uh, we have these fabulous realizations. So those sorts of things don't come from happiness happiness does something else. They don't necessarily come from mindfulness. Mindfulness does. Mindfulness is more of a, a calming and settling of the system and removing of the disturbances. It comes from the activity of engaging in the experience in a way that is taking it to somewhere where you are not, um, it, which is what you were I, saying, Kath, about therapy. Can I ask you a question, Richard, just and comment on some of that, what you've just been talking to, because it's just a it's it's sure. so similar yet so different but so aligned to some of the other things that I've been working on outside of even the therapy space um so in the coaching space they call that generative learning that's right but in the coaching space they're still stuck with this idea that what we need to learn is something uh it's it's very fixed not always but I mean yeah. in general it's how to learn to do what you're doing already in a better way. Uh, the transformational. Uh, no, no, no. I know. I know there's. Coaching. Yeah, I know yeah, there's yeah. that transformational coaching, but that's not the popular coaching. That's yeah, sort yeah, of the exactly. fringe coaching. Yeah, so, so, so you I'm suffer the, at the same th trouble that I do. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, so I guess I'm looking at the transformational coaching side yeah. of things, and. Oh, you've just gone on. Free. That is there you go. very much, and and you know some of the. Yeah, so I'm looking at the transformational coaching stuff and it very much talks into what, but just diff very different language. But yeah. I guess that's just what I wanted to add to the gush. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. yeah. 
Oh, okay. Yes. No, that, that's right. There, there, are, there are areas, and, and it's really good, Ren, I bring that up, as we're saying, transformation, that little interplay we had there, is that this sort of stuff is still thought of as peripheral, as um, out there, as not, not something that is um, mainstream, if we, we do that, because the mainstream is preoccupied with those that want to get more of what they've got. I mean, like I'll do, and as you're saying in the transformation, I'm so sure you do too. Let's go somewhere we've never been before. Let's try and imagine something that we've never imagined. Whereas you want to go to them, you, you want to make uh, money in coaching, tell them, here's how to get a million bucks. <laughs> imagine yourself, imagine that million bucks in front of you. What are you looking like? What are you wearing? What are you doing? And it's it's concentrating and it's and it's 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 um, pulling these things, but in million million bucks. There, there's there's a there's a wonderful example of how they miss it in this transformational stuff. Early early days of mindfulness. So you know, 10, 15 years ago, a colleague of mine went into a company. They said, "Do this mindfulness stuff with us. We like the sound of that. It's all very cool and groovy." So I came along, did this work with the board, and at the end of the the period, two of the board members resigned. They left corporate world because they had they had been avoiding aspects and not actualizing, not realizing uh, elements of themselves uh, that ha that had just remained in the possibility field, but not anyway. They brought them out and they left. He thought, oh, well, that's probably not going to endear me to the company. I may not see them again. So he didn't hear. But two years later, they rang up again. They said, would you come back and do another one of those mindfulness things? And he sort of said, well, I'd love to, that'd be great. Um, but I was a bit worried last time that you were a bit upset about the two guys that left, uh, that left the board. And he said, well, yeah, that wasn't real good, but we understand that now. So here's the people that we want to get rid of. <laughs> totally missing the point of what expansive possibility is all about. It is not controllable, and that's why they don't like it. It's not predictable, and that's why we don't like it, because our economic system and a lot of our social systems as well are linear. This gets to this, gets to this, gets to this. And we all know that actually when you do that, our life is complex and unpredictable, and this goes to this, goes over here, and then over there, and my go here, and everyone's saying, what's wrong with you? Why aren't you following the line? Uh, so, you know, this is the confusion. I get that all. I get that personally all the time. Renee, why won't you follow the linear path? <laughs> yeah. Here's what's obvious. Yes, but look what I've invented. Now, I started my work on the, what, what we're going to now call the possibility solution. I started it just with the curiosity, and my agent in America said, "Ah, uh, we can't sell curiosity." That, that, that won't sell. Now, of course, what am I going to do? I'm going to get upset about it. I'm going to, oh, this is terrible. I'm going to fight or I'm going to react. Of course, I just go, like I described yesterday, the three steps. That's interesting. Wow, what's that all about? Why did she say that? And, of course, the realisation was that everybody is, trans is fixed in curiosity as being information. And everyone's been talking about that and whatever. So this is why uh, I then said, well, so what do I create out of that? So we went on further. Then suddenly I'm doing possibility. And then bang, the sphere, the sphere emerges out of all that sort of indoctrination of the three linear planes and so on and so forth. The probability bridge just emerged about two days ago. I thought, that's what it, that's what it is. Uh, and these are wonderful things. So I actualized something that was possible rather than actualize something because I'm too stupid to you know own up to my own reality uh, which is what we do sometimes in therapy we have to point it say you did do this you know own it and bring it into form but now what do we create with that and that's what you're talking about Kath that <clears throat> getting the, the client to a point where they then go on they're on a roll uh, in their own various ways I'm I'm just I'm I'm kind of just tying two things together at the minute that there's uh, uh, there's a lot of languaging going on in my head at the moment in terms of um, Ken Wilber's transcend and include 
So when when you're um, in integral theory, one of the things, and it's that idea of this transcendence seems to be like this linear, um, you know, like a, playing a game, you level up, uh, you get enough points and then you're on to the next level. And actually I see it as a, um, a continuum that you're constantly, you know, moving up and down across left and right, that there's something about the transcendence doesn't necessarily mean upwards. It means to include that which came before that you understood. And obviously now you, you've brought it into your personality. Yeah. So it, there's something about, I think, I think what I'm hearing, because obviously I'm doing my own thinking at the moment. Yes, sure. I'm, listening, I'm listening to you and kind of synthesizing that there's something about, I think most people think that they have to go through in a linear fashion because you have to complete this stage before you can move on to the next one. And actually, I like the idea of, um, even Ericsson says this, doesn't he, that you kind of go back and you... You, yeah. re, you go back and you go levels. forward. You go yeah. Back. Yeah. And it, it's, the, it's this extraordinary thing. We, we live in a linear, constructed culture. I mean, you go to yeah. school, you go to first class, you go to second class, and every now and again, someone will skip a class or something. Is it? Hello? That's yeah. odd. I, I, I got given heaps for not having a bachelor for so many years, and I only completed my bachelor last year. You, younger, younger. No, you no, but I had, a, I had a master's, had a master's 10 years ago. So oh, this see. is, this is, no yeah. one's open to that possibility. <laughs> well, I, I didn't even start till I was 46. And, uh, and, and or 40, 44 rather, it took me six years to get my bachelor's degree because it was interesting, and I was yeah, yeah, busy, yeah. And, I, and I was I was a bit busy. I guess so, I was bringing that in as a as a new possibility that we even even in education we must do things in such an order that it has to be done. So I did my graduate diploma first, yeah. then a master's, then a bachelor's. Like why not? Yeah, and this is the thing of of, of just saying, Kath, there rather than moving forward, although Wilbur's lovely, but he's constrained by social, social pressures of, of definitions, that you're ex you actually just find yourself expanding into the field. Mm. And as you expand into the field, more elements of the field come into your, uh, come into your grasp and into your play. Uh, and it was really beautiful. We were at a, a conference somewhere and uh, uh, we had, it was America, it was Native Americans, or it could have been in Canada with the that we call the, the First Nations. But um, he said, it's weird, you guys. You talk about this and this and this all the time and that. You've got this hand and that hand and then this and this and this and this. And you're always going like these beat things. He said, we don't. We always sit there and we say, and then we've got the, this problem, we've got that. So we, we actually just, our, our, we are imbued with this natural, culturally, life experience sense of, dimension of three dimensions and there was this wonderful book written in the late 1800s by a guy named um somebody abbott and he was called flatland don't know whether you've ever ever seen it he gets pulled out every now and again so he's writing a story about a land that is two-dimensional so everybody's just two-dimensional they have length and breadth that's all they have so you're a square or you're a circle uh hello mr circle and so everything is done in this, and that's how they live. Now, strangely, by some peculiar um, esoteric weirdness, uh, they have this religious, almost religious uh, idea, but it's become a legal thing that on this particular night, once a year, nobody is to go outside, curfew, cannot go outside. And if you go outside and you're caught, you're thrown in jail. And uh, so, oh, so of course, this guy goes on through his life to square. And uh, he decides he's going to go out and he goes out. And what actually happens is the three-dimensional world becomes visible. And so there he is, is something only ever known two dimensions and a sphere enters his space. Now he's freaking out. My God, this is the heavens, the aliens, the things. I, I don't know what it's all about. So that he goes the next day running around saying, I saw this thing and it was like a circle, but a whole bunch of circles and they all kind of, thrown in jail so he was thrown in jail for being non-linear uh he, there's a little bit where he goes off and he finds dot world so where everybody's just a point and so they think he's weird and it's these dimensionalities of our perception that both um 
uh, that can be both exciting to explore, but broadly constrain us. Uh, now, is there something beyond the three dimensions? And we argue that time is another dimension, but of course, um, we then go through the fascination of what Einstein told us, that space time, that space and time are a collective thing. So this is getting a bit too theoretical and a bit too over the top, but it is so fascinating how we can find ourselves constrained. Um, you know, I love you as different from I love you. And this idea within teaching, open your arms, embrace is a terminology, be kind and compassionate, send out this, this, this abstract concept broadly, uh, spherically, uh, and we struggle with it. We struggle with it uh, because they say, yeah, but what's right and what's wrong, what's good and what's bad, what am I supposed to do, what am I not supposed to do, these dichotomous um, linear options. Uh, and uh, curiosity, however, is the key to releasing you from those constraints because curiosity only wants to go somewhere that it isn't. And that's what's so fascinating. Almost every other emotion, uh, it, it's not, not as effective in taking you from where you are to somewhere you're not uh, as, as curiosity is. So I have a question for you then, Richard, which is in that curiosity, do you think there's something about, um, so I'm just thinking here about language, culture, that actually our curiosity needs to take us into spaces and places where there aren't words that exist, where there aren't cultures that, that we're familiar with, that that's really the, the true epitome of what curiosity is. Absolutely. And we don't even have to go back in uh, mad time machines to figure all this out. We just have to look at a child. Mm. Um, look, I've got a three-year-old granddaughter and she's there and these words are emerging and these this expansive uh, nature of the way that she can now um, gradually more and more express words. But the beautiful thing about language and which is what um, um, our generative language brilliant man anyway who's very political um but what he was saying is that we actually words at language are just symbolic representations that enable us to have a a an actuality that can occur to a perceived uh uh self and a perceived self mm. And so all our words are symbolic. So all our words have the potential to be something they're not, something more than they are. They're all literal actualities and metaphors at the same time. And we can put them together in ways that everybody else can understand what we're saying. Uh, so we have language structure that is natural to us all. Uh, and curiously, each different language, each child in a different language uh, pattern space will learn the pattern, discard the other patterns and formulate their actuality experience in that particular pattern. Trouble is if we just bring it in and say, you always have to do that right. You know, this is the way you write correctly. This is the way you add up correctly. This is the way you do as different, what, my beautiful friend doing art classes and they were painting something and she bumped someone's elbow and they spilt their, their tea on the painting. And everybody of course went, oh dear, bad thing has happened. Painting is ruined. Tea is not supposed to be on a painting. And the teacher have just said, oh wow, let's see what happens. And suddenly you get Dali and, and Cubism and expressionism and and um, van gogh and you know all these amazing things emerging out of the actuality the probability into a possibility space that we never knew existed awesome um richard we're nearly out of time cool. maybe we should leave uh, to, just for one or two questions Ju julie's been um lovely just sitting here she said she's kind of just been happy to just, just um, you know, have have her video off, and and um, she said it's yeah. making a lot of sense. 
she's happy to listen and just learn and she's still studying counselling. Yes, I, I hope I've been helpful, Julie, and not gone off on too much fields of fancy. It's trying to, it's trying to grasp these concepts because we need our left side uh, actuality and realisation. Our left brain does this and gives it detail and form. Mm -hmm. But it's from that form that we can then springboard back into the right side which is more conceptual and, and again, that, that area where possibilities can be more expressed. And then we grab some possibilities and we go, oh yeah. And then poof, we chuck it back here and the left side of our brain uh, gives it form and shape and functionality that we can incorporate into our experience. But the idea is to throw it back and, the, and that corpus callosum that we have down the middle of our, our, our brain connecting the two hemispheres, everyone thinks it's this great connector. Did you know that most of the neurons in the corpus callosum are inhibitory? They are to stop things just flowing in and out. They have things flow on need and then flow back. So this is the perfect brain. Mm. And uh, you know, my Not favorite this double connected. Yeah, my favorite favorite book, and it was the it's the only book that's ever made me go, oh my god! I thought it was this way. So of course, the, you're talking neuroscience at the minute, Richard. I was reading neuroscience. I've read neuroscience, and then I went back and read a book called The Bicameral Mind, and it's about how I male. You, oh my goodness, that completely threw spun me around into a completely new way of thinking about how the brain actually works and communicates in terms of evolution and the back end of the brain. And, and it's really interesting. I see lots of people going, oh, the limbic system. I'm like, no, 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 no. You need to be talking cerebellum. <laughs> that's just where I'm at at the moment. Yes. Going, that's the seat. That's the place we need to be focusing on. I mean, and it, and it is a place to focus on. But then I go, so let's get past that yeah. and talk about it all. And, but that's the oh, difficulty. I'm, I'm stuck at, it's yeah, like, I'm stuck at the cerebellum at the minute. <laughs> No, I know, but I've been doing this for 20 years, so it's, it's a bit helpful. But it's, um, it's this thing, it's like playing jazz, jazz music. You, you know, I remember uh, Chick Corea was once asked by, uh, uh, he, was a, he, was a, he was a very avant-garde uh, jazz pianist, and he was asked by this kid, hey, man, how can I improvise like you? It's my bad impression of a uh, <laughs> sort of doped out jazz guy. And uh, he said, what you can do is you can go learn to play and you can do the scales and you can learn to read music and you can learn to play music and you play the classics and you play the things and you play literally and you play technically and you do exactly what your teacher says. And if you're lucky, you'll get one with a ruler that'll slap you over the back of the hand until you get it just perfectly technically, then you just forget it and play. But of course, what he was meaning was you don't forget it. You wait till all that technicality is imbued and then suddenly it flows. And that can take, there's your, there's your, your 10,000 hours, your 10 years, your um, uh, all that sort of stuff. And I used to think I know, knew stuff as I look back on my life, I go, oh yeah, I really knew what I was talking about then. I go, mm, not really. I really knew what I was talking about then, mm, not really. And now I'd say, I don't know whether I know what I'm talking about, but it flows. And uh, uh, so it feels, it's feeling right now. And that's why Ernie, my mentor said, uh, uh, you know, it's your turn, your time uh, now. And I went, oh, okay. And then he dies. So he meant it, <laughs> you know. So that, that's what you're alluding to in terms of wisdom, isn't it? Is that's when wisdom becomes something that you, you do, you are embodied. Yeah, you're, you're embodied and embraced and you're in the spherical frame and you're no longer going through things to get anywhere. You're just engaged uh, and things will come come to you uh, uh, with readiness and ease, uh, which doesn't mean you don't go and do very simple things like go down the street and buy scrambled eggs and have a cup of coffee uh, and pay them money, all those, all those uh, practical aspects they're still true they're still true so here we go yes thanks julie got there the the uh definitely not a linear person yay 
Uh, Excellent. But haven't you felt guilty being being a non-linear person? People kept saying, oh, now you do this and then this and then this and then this. And you're going, well, how about I do... Ugh. Yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but over time... This is non-linear here, <laughs> non-linear thinking. Yeah. Um, so we need to go over to Kath so that, yeah, because we've pretty much run out of time. Oh, no, we're over now. Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yes. Because we could um, we could keep going all night probably. No, it's that's right. okay. I I cannot follow this. This that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Richard, if it's okay with you, um, I'd love for you to hang around with the with Cat's conversation because I think you'd want to hear this if you I can. Know, I, again, I, I ideally want it to be free. I've got so many commitments at the moment. Oh good. And, um, oh, good. and uh and, and it's all awful. I'm still in the office and it's uh, yeah. Uh, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. All good. Sorry, Kath. I, I'll I, see I, you next no, time. No, that's okay. Richard, you, you know, there's a there's a thing about um we're in connection, there's there's lots to be said yeah. about, you know, it's it's gonna be conversations that go forward anyway. So well I'll be one of those people, the uh, horrendous people checking it out late. But uh, yeah, so so I, I I love you all. I love you all. Uh, all but right. I'm gonna go off and write a book. Thanks, uh, Richard. Thank you. Bye. Okay, bye. bye.